know a little bit about the audience before I get into the topic. Uh, how many people here are developers, Java developers? Majority, okay. Uh, people who are not developers, what QA, any QAs in the audience? Or business analysts? No? Managers? Anyone DevOps? We've called itself DevOps. Okay. Okay. That's kind of what I any anyone else that I didn't follow? Okay. Uh, this talk, uh, there's not a lot of code in this talk, unfortunately. Uh, I do have a lot of code in my book, which I'll show a link later if people are interested. This talk is more about some patterns and principles for uh, doing DevOps and continuous delivery. Uh, before I get into that, uh, I need to talk a little bit about ThoughtWorks because not everyone knows about us. Uh, we are a software consulting company. We work with clients in very different industries uh, around the world. Uh, we've been around for almost 20 years uh, by now. Uh, and we like to, we build custom software for most of our projects, and we like to say we solve the hardest problems for our clients. So people don't hire us to like install a package solution usually. Uh, they'll hire us when building custom software actually makes a difference to their business. And we like to say like that's, that's where <coughs> building software is, is really interesting. We also have a product division of ThoughtWorks, uh, some tools we've released, uh, Mingo, Go CD is one uh, that's open source now. Uh, SnapCI, there's a few uh, products that we put out. Uh, we actually have a lot of offices uh, around the world, uh, probably around 30 offices by now. I'm not sure because I lose count of people opening. Uh, we have offices in Brazil, Ecuador, uh, Europe, China, India, uh, everywhere. And you might know us from some uh, either books or tools that we put out as open source. Uh, Martin Fowler is our famous uh, chief scientist, and most people know who Martin Fowler is. So that's the usually, usual way I present works. and I work for Martin Fowler's company. Uh, Remote, he published a lot of books around database refactoring, NoSQL. Uh, there's a bunch of open source, uh, actually Selenium, if people who do uh, test, uh, automated testing probably use Selenium. That was a tool that was born out of ThoughtWorks project. Uh, and the other thing we do is we publish the Technology Raider. Uh, that's a bi-annual publication where all the big heads of the works get together. Uh, they just got here in Chicago last month, so they're working. We just launched, I think, the, the latest one. And we talked about what are some of the lessons we learned on projects on the ground. What are the cool technologies that are coming out? Tools, platforms, uh, techniques. What are the things that we like? What are the things that we don't like? Uh, so it's kind of like an opinionated uh, publish uh, that we do. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to, to read that. And of course, uh, as Dinah said, we were hiring for positions. Uh, right now, these are some of our open, uh, open positions in uh, North America. Uh, if you're interested in applying or learning a little bit more about what we do, uh, here is Dinah's contact. Um, I'll share the slides later, so you don't have to copy this now. And you can also go to our website. And that's pretty much what I had for the supports field. I'm going to talk a little bit about me before I get into the topic. Uh, I've done many, I'm, I, I like to call myself like a generalist or polyglot uh, technologist. Uh, most of my career I've done a lot of development, I've done a lot of Java development, uh, developing on the JVM. These days there's many languages we have to know. I've done Ruby, I've done Python. Uh, right now I'm doing kind of like an architect role, so not so much hands-on anymore, uh, but still talking to a lot of the technical folks on the ground. Uh, coaching, I've done some training. We had like cloud training uh, some, some time ago, and I saw the AWS meetups are coming up. Uh, it's a topic that I'm really passionate about as well. So I'm happy to talk about uh, that at the break if anyone's interested. Uh, and then other thing that most people don't know, actually my first, when I got into this industry, I started out as a system administrator before I became a developer. So when I was in university, uh, I was one of the system administrators for our university uh, Linux network. We had about 300 uh, students, three to 500 students. Uh, this is back in Brazil, so I'm, I'm from Sao Paulo. Uh, and I learned some of these things. Before I learned how to code, I was learning how to deal with users, how to set up servers and network and firewalls. And at that time, we didn't have a lot of the nice tools that we have today, so we would spend the weekends installing Linux, like running from machine to machine. Uh, it was very manual and laborious process. So with that background, uh, and then later becoming a developer, knowing how to build applications, uh, people started talking about DevOps, and 
I, I saw that uh, that name and I'm like, oh, I, I, I always tended, I always uh, saw myself in projects helping out with like the build process, how to set up the pipelines and how to do automation. Just because of my background, that was my natural inclination. And then when DevOps became uh, a thing, I realized, oh, I've been doing DevOps, they gave it a nice name now. <laughs> so based on that experience, uh, I wrote a book uh, it was originally published in Portuguese, so it wasn't very accessible for the rest of the world. Uh, but two weeks ago, uh, we managed to get a deal with the Pragmatic Programmers Bookshelf, and they are distributing an English version of the book now. So if you're interested, that's the link there. Uh, right now it's only ebook, uh, but most people I've heard are buying electronic books right now. And as I said, there's a lot of, a lot of code in there. So DevOps in practice, the title means like that's the, the content that you, that you expect to find in the book. And that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, so there's a lot of infrastructure automation, uh, deploying to the cloud, I have some uh, some examples how to, how to put a production system, actually it's a Java application, deployed to AWS. So it's pretty interesting, there's a lot of uh, uh, hands-on in the book. I think the sound code. Uh, I, I have to chase that. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I wasn't sure that it was so. I knew that negotiations were ongoing uh, about publishing with the frag frogs, but uh, even my my publisher didn't tell me. I, I learned about it from other people saying, "Hey, congratulations on the book! I saw the newsletter," and they emailed me maybe like an hour after that saying the deal is on and it went they went fast. So I, I don't have all the all the details yet, but I can try to get a discount code for, for the book. Uh, where does DevOps come from? Uh, this is the traditional way, uh, and this is the motivation for, for the movement. Uh, a lot of companies, you, you have different teams to deal with developing new applications, and then the team that runs the applications and run everything in production, right? And the motivation for the development teams is always like, I want changes, right? Uh, we are measured by how many features we can deliver, uh, how many new things, how many bug, bugs we fix, uh, how many improvements we make to the systems. So change is, is, is one of the motivations. Uh, the operations folks on the other side, they want stability because they're measured on like how much uptime does the system have, uh, how stable is it in production, they don't want any outages. And that creates kind of like an interesting tension because change is the enemy of stability, right? If, if I want something to be stable, I, I don't want to touch it, right? It's, it's running. The more I try to change it, the more risk I introduce, uh, the less stable it's likely to become. Um, and in many, many companies, they make it even worse by putting a big wall between these two teams uh, and different reporting structures, different measurements and incentives. So it makes it really hard for those two teams to collaborate. And as I'm gonna talk about today, uh, one of the keys uh, principles from behind DevOps is actually bridging that gap. Uh, because you want to be able to change fast, but do it in a way that doesn't introduce a lot of risk, so you keep things stable. It's a little bit of a paradox, but people that practice DevOps, they can attest to there are many practices that help you achieve that. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation with a story from a project I was on a couple years ago. And it's probably a common story. Uh, I called it the day we failed our deployment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we were working for this client. Uh, we were actually building software, releasing software every two weeks. Uh, so two week iterations, going to production actually every two weeks. So we had a fairly regular uh, deployment schedule. Uh, the only problem was um, the deployment process was very manual. Uh, so there was a client engineer that was the specialist for how to do the deployment. He had all the keys to the kingdom. We as consultants, we, didn't, we, we weren't allowed to do that, unfortunately. We were helping build the software, but they were the ones that would deploy it. And it was this one guy that had all the knowledge, so he knew like where all the servers were, where all the access keys were, uh, how to do all the configuration. And so the deployment was kind of like a ceremony. Every two weeks, someone would have to be elected from the team to be like the person <coughs> that would support the deployment. But it was this opaque thing that the other guy was gonna do, and if something goes wrong, they might ask for your help. Uh, and guess what, one day things went wrong. But no one actually noticed. So the problem happened, he put all the code in production and then he would change all the configuration files, run all the batch jobs that he had to run. Uh, and one of the things we did was, there was like a search capability on this application, so we had to do the indexing for a search. 
And he forgot, he actually misconfigured one of the files to point to the staging database instead of the production database. Oh, wow. And then when we run the ingestion, it, it, it basically ingested production <laughs> with some fake data or outdated data. So it wasn't like a ca ca catastrophic error. Things seemed to be running, the application was up. Uh, people did, whoever was supporting did a quick smoke test and was like, yeah, I can access all this functionality, everything looks good. So we went home, everyone went home. The next day, the business people were doing a demo for potential clients. And they went on, of course, Red is gonna fail the worst time. Uh, they, in front of a client, they're like, yeah, we have this feature, you can search for like all the history of all these things. And they were gonna do a demo, and of course, things didn't work, and that's when we realized that it indexed all the wrong things. So that was bad, the, the business was not happy. Uh, that guy was not happy. We were not happy. And who, who has a similar story? This one is not so bad. I, I've heard some worse ones. <laughs> like, a, oops, I, I deleted the database. Or, <laughs> could be worse. Uh, the usual way that companies deal with this when things go wrong is they add process, right? So it's like, let's stop this thing from happening ever again. So they could fire the guy as well. Sometimes that happens. Uh, but when you add process, it's an attempt to try to prevent that same thing from happening again. So now I'm, I'm going to need some, you need to document all the steps that you're going to run when you do a deployment. You need to follow a run book and 10 people need to look at that document and approve that before you can actually run that, that, doc, that, pro, that process in production. <coughs> There's going to be a deployment window where you can do that, so you cannot do that anytime anymore. And you keep adding, adding more and more bureaucracy. Uh, the problem is when you add this process, more process, you create this, uh, this, the opposite of a virtual cycle. What is this? Uh, uh, the more process you have, the less frequent you're gonna do deployments. Because now you have all this process to deal with. I need to get all the approvals, I need to get everyone on the call to look at the changes. I need to write that run book before it can actually get executed. So I, I'm not able to run a lot of deployments, right? So you decrease the frequency. And the last time you deploy, then the amount of things that gets deployed increases, right? So you're batching up more things because I cannot deploy every time. So I'm gonna deploy every two weeks or every month. Now I have changes, everything that the development team built from the last month to deploy. And the more changes you have to deploy, the bigger the risk that some of those things are gonna create a problem in production. And of course, if the problem actually happens, you're gonna add more process, and then you enter this, uh, this cycle where things get worse and worse. Uh, in that case, we didn't do that. We didn't fire the guy. We couldn't fire the guy. He was nice, actually. Uh, but we solved it. We didn't want to introduce more process either. So what we did is actually, uh, I suggested that I would ferry him the next deployment. So I, I wasn't going to perform any, any of the tasks. I was just going to shadow the guy. And what I did is watching what he was doing, I wrote down post-it notes of every single step, manual step that he was doing. So I, I was basically like a reporter, just documenting the deployment process that was in his head. And I was also taking notes. Every time he would have a question or stuff to think about, like a decision, it's like, oh, what should I do next? Or where should I look for this information? I was take note of that as well. And <coughs> that's all I did for that night. I stayed, I stayed uh, at night with, with that guy, just documenting the process. I put it on the wall, we went home. And then the next day we actually, as a team, we came back to that wall and we looked. So now we're not talking about that guy anymore or the mistake that he did. We're actually talking about improving that process. And of course there were many, many opportunities where we can do automation and improve that process. So as a team, we managed to write some uh, improvement stories for the deployment process. And the business now, because they were burned about that story, they didn't want that to happen again. We used that to actually convince them that we needed some time for our uh, iterations to work on process improvement, deployment process improvement. And then over time, we got it, it got better. So that's why DevOps, uh, and in this case, automation <coughs> breaks that cycle. Because instead, uh, instead of adding process, we actually automate that process. So we let the computer run it for us <coughs> instead of humans. And then when you break that cycle, then you can deploy more frequently. So you increase the frequency. And when you deploy more frequently, the amount of changes that go out with each of those deployments reduces. 
and with less changes, then there is less risk. Or when something goes wrong, then there's less things that could have caused that, that failure. Uh, when I left that client, we, were, we weren't actually in the perfect case scenario where we would run deploy at any time during the day. The business was still a little bit concerned about running when users were still using the system. So we would still have some uh, deployment windows. But by automating a lot of the manual <coughs> steps, the ingestion, uh, the indexing, uh, the configuration of the environment, uh, they were getting more comfortable with that. Uh, and then it was kind of like whoever was staying that night to support the deployment, it wasn't so bad anymore. Because <coughs> you would just click the button and like watch the script run. And most of the time it would just succeed and then people would just go home after 10 minutes. <coughs> or half an hour, depending on how long it would take. So the goal uh, is to make deployment a non-event. And that's one of the principles that I want you guys to take away from this presentation. Uh, Every time there is this dreaded, dread, dreaded feeling of staying late for deployment or things going wrong, uh, that's where DevOps practice try to solve that problem is by letting people sleep at night and automating a lot of the boring work. So as you might guess, one of the first patterns that DevOps apply is automation. And if you think about that deployment process, taking a code uh, to production, there are many, many steps where you can introduce automation. So I'm going to show you a few. So let's say you have an idea, and you want to get the, that idea to production. You need to write some code. Uh, these are some of the steps that you might that are very uh, easy to automate. So you're going to write your codes. You have to do some testing. These days, automated testing is kind of accepted practice, or it's very widely adopted. Uh, running these tests, and every time you commit code, is the practice known as, as continuous integration, and that's also a very widely adopted practice these days. Uh, it's very more and more common for us to see that uh, in clients. Uh, however, most people stop the CI process at this stage. You, you run the test, you produce a package maybe, and you publish that package, and that's, that's where the cycle ends. However, there are many other steps that are uh, automated, automatable after that. Uh, you need to set up the servers, set up the environments, get the package deployed to those servers. There's many, many tools these days that can facilitate that automation. Uh, this one, unfortunately, you still cannot automate humans. Uh, you're going to do some form of exploratory testing or UAT so people can look and make sure they're happy with what's uh, going out. But then the deployment itself can also be automated, right? Once people are happy, you can click the button, and then there's many tools that help us get the code, get the configuration, uh, put in the right environment, doing the right sequences of steps to get that code ready for production. So that's the difference between the continuous integration and what we call uh, continuous delivery. It's looking at this whole pipeline, and when you automate the whole process from code to production, uh, we call that the deployment pipeline. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this deployment pipeline. So the deployment pipeline is going to be different from team to team, from company to company, because this process will change, right? Some companies might have more validation steps they have to go through, more people, they might have more or less manual approval steps on the way. Uh, but even the manual steps you want to you wanna introduce in this type of uh, pipeline, so the people can do their manual work and say, I'm happy with this, they click the button and the pipeline moves on. And when you're working with the deployment pipeline, Every commit is a potential release candidate. So every change, so as a developer, that's something that you have to learn when you're developing this kind of environment. If every commit that you make could potentially be go to production. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about some other patterns for like how to deal with writing code in a way that it's safe for you to put your code in production. But when you check in, the first feedback loop that you get from this deployment pipeline is the version control might trigger some automated build and automated tests uh, in your pipeline. And if it fails, it will kill that say that this is not a good release candidate. If it passes that stage, then you might have some more higher level automated acceptance functional tests that will try to test the app as a whole. And if that fails, it might take a little bit longer, you get feedback as well. And as you as you define and automate these steps, uh, you get to a point where Maybe one commit is gonna pass all the tests and all the stages and it will be good to go to production. So that will be actually uh, something that's out. Uh, 
So Question. by that, you mean like everything you collect triggers a whole new building, you can make a test, you can make a test. Yeah. <coughs> but what about if I'm just creating a pull request, and you know, when you're creating a pull request, you, you have many shapes on it, but you don't want to trigger a full like, build plan or whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's a theory, so <coughs> when you do it pull requests, uh, based uh, workflow. Mm -hmm. uh, this changes a little bit because you might have multiple things happening oh, at the same time. So you can decide. Uh, actually, some of the CI CD tools actually support building off of different branches if you're doing that. Uh, but at some point, you want that thing to be integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually like to advocate for trunk based development, which is different from working in branches. We actually work everyone, the whole team, in the same master. And I'm going to talk about some of the techniques to avoid people stepping <coughs> on each other's toes. Uh, but actually integrating the code continuously okay. uh, versus if you have branches, you might potentially have codes that's living separate from the rest of the code base for a long time. Uh, so this is one example of a pipeline. This one is another example I used in another client. They had actually multiple services, different apps uh, managed by different teams. So they had more stages of integration. They would integrate their own stuff or they would integrate with other people's things. Uh, they would have more environments for doing different steps of integration. But the point was trying to go from that commit and version control all the way to the point to production. And as you see, it kind of fans in along the way because at some point things are going to integrate and you, you only have one production. Once you have the code in production, there's actually many other things that are uh, when you're doing frequent deployments, we'll give you quick feedback cycles. So you can do monitoring of what's <coughs> running in production. If things go wrong, you might raise alerts, so you can detect things more uh, quickly. Uh, you have to support. There's a lot of data analytics that you can do once you're gathering actual usage from your application running in production. You might gather feedback from users about this new feature or something that you released. <coughs> and that will give you new insights to generate new ideas. Uh, and this is, this is the cycle of continuous <coughs> delivery. Getting an idea from concept to cash, right? From the idea into production. But also once it's production, you get some more insights to generate new ideas. And you want to cycle through that uh, very fast. OK, so when you work in this mode, something happens. Uh, you can decrease the cycle time. So cycle time is the time between making the change and having that change the quality production because you're running through this cycle faster. But the quality is going up uh, at the same time. So how can, we, how can we achieve that? How can we get uh, low risk so we can do these deployments very fast, but also keeping the quality and instability up? So I'm going to give you uh, four principles for thinking about this. So principles is kind of like thinking tools. They're not very uh, actionable in a way. It's more how you, how you approach a problem. And then I have some patterns that are a little bit more uh, practical. So the first principle is incremental is better than Big Bang. So Big Bang, let's suppose you have to introduce a change. This one is kind of easy to grasp. Uh, Big Bang is when you work on that change. So like in the example, if you're working on a separate branch, for instance, uh, from everyone else, you make all your, all your work separate from everyone else. And one day, it goes live uh, in one Big Bang. That's not, that's something that people do, but I'm advocating for trying to do things in an incremental way. So instead of building everything, what's the minimal thing that I can build and release? Uh, and then I go through that cycle again, and I might learn something new. So I change what I had before, and then I add something new, and then I do that again, I add something new. So over time, uh, you get to the full, uh, the full picture, not in one big bang. Because big bang, as we said before, is big change, big risk. So that's one principle, pretty straightforward. The second one is think about deploy uh, not being the same thing as release. Uh, what do I mean by that? So this is a cathedral in Milan. Uh, I was there a couple years ago. And they were doing some renovation work here. I'm going to zoom in that picture. Uh, so they were working on the facade, cleaning things up, uh, um, renovating it. But they put this interesting scaffold in front that was kind of like a picture of what was behind it. So if you're looking from afar, you don't, you don't actually realize that it was there's a lot of construction work happening there. Uh, and this is a good illustration of what I mean by deploy and release. So 
the fact that you deploy the code to production doesn't necessarily mean that it's available, readily available for people to see or use it. That's a key, uh, a key principle. Uh, you can deploy code and have it switched off somehow. We're going to talk about some ideas for that, or being not available right now. Uh, so that's when the business or someone's happy about actually releasing that code, they can press the button, and that's when you reveal what's, what was behind the curtain. So that's a way to, you can do that deployment more frequently, but that doesn't mean you're going to be releasing new things all the time. Uh, some, uh, some applications, you might actually not want to do this all the time, like if it's a mobile app that you build, for instance. The process of like pushing updates to the app store can take like days sometimes. So you don't want to do that like every day because it's going to be really painful. So in some situations, you might actually want to batch. But the interesting thing is when you decouple those two concepts, uh, you can, if, if you're not in that restricted scenario, if you're building like a web application or some internet available thing, you can keep deploying code and you switch it on when it's ready for prime time. The third one is focusing on uh, small batches instead of big batches. So it's a little bit related to the first one, the incremental versus big bang. Uh, but I like to, to think about this, this example. Uh, it's not my idea, but when things go wrong, because things still, unfortunately, are still going to go wrong. So I'm not trying to sell a magic uh, answer for everything. But to illustrate that principle of when you have <coughs> less change, you have less risk. So on the right side, we have the BMW approach. So if you buy a BMW or an expensive car, you usually don't want it to break very, very often, right? And when, you, when something goes wrong, it's probably going to cost you a lot of money to get it fixed. So this, these type of cars, they're built for uh, not breaking so much, and then they'll make some money when, when it does break. Uh, the other approach is the Jeep approach. So this, these cars are actually built to break all the time and to be very easy to fix. Uh, there's actually some YouTube videos, people like building the whole thing in like, I don't know, 10 minutes. Uh, so when things go wrong, in this case, it's kind of expected that it will go wrong. So we optimize for making sure we fix things really fast. Versus here, I don't want things to go wrong a lot. And when they do go wrong, then it might take some time or it might cost me money to get things back up. Uh, in operations terminology, uh, this approach is called mean time between failures. So a lot of operations teams are measured against this metric. So mean time between failure is how long, in average, it takes between an outage or a failure and the next one. And you want that to be as big as possible. So you want to minimize the failure. Uh, in, in other scenarios, it's the mean time to recover. So I'm not going to count how long it takes between failures. But when something happens, I want to measure how long it takes for things to get back up. And I want to optimize for that thing to be very short. And this is what a lot of companies do, uh, Netflix, to try to, because they're doing that rapid cycle, you want to be able to fix things really fast as well. So we try not to optimize for the time, mean time between failure, but mean time to recover. And then the last principle is building quality in the process. Uh, this is a worker. There's a safety net here under the, the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and quality is what gives you confidence to make those changes. So if you invest, if you don't have a good suite of automated tests or you don't have a good suite of functional tests, <coughs> it's very uh, risky. You make a change and you don't know if things are going to break or not. Uh, that's not very good for if you're going to deploy things very fast because you're not going to be confident that it's, it's working. Uh, building quality in, it's what gives you that safety net, that confidence to make the changes. So if I have this safety net, I'm going to have less fear for making the change, which makes the risk a little bit more controlled. So investing in this uh, test automation actually pays back from the system's perspective. OK, so let me get into some more uh, practical patterns that you can apply these principles. And I'm going to try to call out which principles they demonstrate. Uh, so the first one is a pattern called parallel change. Uh, this is the other bridge in San Francisco. Uh, it's the Bay Bridge. And as you guys know, the West Coast, they have risks of having earthquakes all the time. And the, Bay, the old Bay Bridge, right now they already switched to the new one, was, uh, was not built for uh, being resilient to an earthquake. So they wanted to have a more uh, earthquake-proof bridge. Uh, what they didn't do was like, OK, we're going to switch off the old Bay Bridge wait for 10, 15 years, we're going to build a new one, and then everyone can start using it. 
They didn't do that. What they did is they started building the new bridge alongside the old one, so people could still use the old one, and it did take some years to get there. Uh, once the new one was ready, that's when they switched over. And that's exactly what this pattern is, parallel change. So this demonstrates the idea for doing uh, incremental better than Big Bang, and also thinking small batches. The other name for this pattern is, uh, you might have heard as expand and contract. And I'm gonna give an example in code now, so I'm gonna show some Java. I, I said there wasn't a lot of code. That's the, that's the section where there's a little bit of code. So let's say I have a class grid uh, that has an uh, array of arrays of cells. And I have some methods where I can add a cell in a given position, I can fetch a cell, and I can check if that position is empty. And I'm trying to make a refactoring uh, to introduce, let's say, a point class or a position class to represent this x, y coordinate instead of using the primitives. So if I'm doing this uh, without following this pattern, I would just start changing all these method signatures, create a new class, and then you break everyone that was calling these methods because you're gonna have to change the color codes as well to, to introduce this new uh, object, right? Uh, if I'm doing span and contract or parallel change, I'm not gonna break this right away. So what I do is during this expand phase, I actually add the new API or the new uh, protocol for this class. I call it coordinate here. So I'm gonna have to change the internal data structure where I save that. Uh, there's a new way, so when I add a cell, I'm gonna give you a coordinate instead of the x, y. Fetch cell takes a coordinate, it empty takes a coordinate. And I'm gonna have these two implementations living side by side in parallel. Why do I do that? Because I wanna reduce the risk. So if I deploy this code right now, I didn't break anything, and this code can actually be in production <coughs> without being used by uh, everyone. Uh, so now you can go through this migration phase. So you have a bunch of different clients across your code base calling the old API, and now you have added this new version uh, alongside that, that uses a new data structure. So slowly you can start migrating one client, uh, one use at a time, and at every point during this change, you can still deploy this code to production and be safe that everything is working. Uh, so you, you have this kind of migration phase where things are a little bit ambiguous, because you have two things that do the same thing. But from a risk management uh, perspective, you reduce the risk because uh, you're not breaking everything all at once. You're doing this change in an incremental way. Uh, if you only had three, this is a very simple example. You might actually all do all of that in one commit, right? But in real life, you actually have like a whole code base. You might have, I don't know, uh, hundreds or thousands of callers and you don't want to break that all in one code. So once you're happy, you migrated everyone to the new version, then you can go back to the code and then it's the contract phase. So during the first phase, you have the two bridges or the two implementations running in parallel. You slowly migrate people from one to the other, and then you can contract back and then delete the, the old API. And along the way, every step is, is deployable to production, so you don't break things. So this pattern works for the code, so I gave a code example here. Uh, but it actually works when you're doing bigger types of architecture changes. Uh, I've done this in clients before. Uh, I need to change this to talk to the database to use a service API, for instance. I'm not gonna do that in one go. That's a big change. So I do it in parallel. I start building out the API for the service. I start changing clients one by one to use the new API, and some are still gonna use the old one. And then when everyone's migrated, I can kill the old implementation. But this way, uh, you assume that both clients doesn't share states. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> there's some complications. <laughs> but as, as, as a pattern, it's, it's a very useful PT tool. Uh, there's some, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, to, how you can handle that when you have shared states. Uh, but yeah, there's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it also works for deployment. So I'm gonna share another deployment problem, uh, pattern that uses this, this, this pattern. Uh, and it's called blue-green deployment. Mm -hmm. And this one demonstrates the idea that deploying doesn't necessarily mean release. <coughs> what happened? Oh, there you go. Slow. Uh, so blue-green blue deployment, uh, let's say I have a new version of my entire stack that I need to uh, make available to users. Uh, blue-green deployment advocates for having two environments, one called green, the other one called blue. So if you have a web server, an application server, a database server, you might have users being routed to the, let's say the green version is the one that's live right now. 
uh, I deployed a new version of the code to this blue environment. And this is actually not in release yet, so I can deploy it here, I can test, I can do UAT in this second version. And if everyone is happy with that, I can flip people to start using that, and then I can either discard this or use that environment for the next, the next deployment. Uh, this helps with, uh, if you have to do zero downtime deployments, for instance, uh, instead of switching before everything is ready, you can make sure the whole environment is ready before you make the switch, and then the switch is gonna be much, much faster than having to wait for things to come up. Uh, but when I talk about this, one question always it always comes up, and you actually brought it up before, right? Like, uh, what about this guy, right? If I have shared, actually the database will have some shared states. Uh, what about the database? Uh, so we can actually apply that principle that incremental is better than beginning. And this is how uh, we actually deal with this type of problem. We break that, that up, and you can apply the same thing for the database side than from the application side. So assuming your application is stateless, I can actually deploy, so I have my current version, let's say it's always a green environment here. I deploy the new version of the application on the side, and then I switch my users to use the new version of the application, but it's still pointing to the old database version. Uh, and then I can decouple my database deployments from my application deployments. Uh, and a lot of companies actually do that because database changes are usually more risky. They introduce more risks because it's a shared state, it might affect multiple, you might have multiple applications using the same database. So uh, by decoupling that, you can actually have different release cycles for those changes. Uh, and then you flip the database. There's some, there's some database practices that you have to do if you wanna do that. So for instance, you need to keep your application and the database backwards compatible. So if I'm making, let's say, between the green and the blue version of the database, I need to uh, rename a call. Uh, if I rename and I change my application codes to refer to the new name, then when this guy is using the old version, it's not gonna work because it's, it's gonna expect the new column name. So uh, database refactoring techniques actually, they explicitly have this migration phase as well. So instead of renaming the column, you actually create a new column with the new name and you keep the old column with the old name for this to work, and you keep those things in sync during this migration phase. Uh, and then when the application is switched over to use the new database, then you can remove the old name. So there's a whole book on database refactoring, and it's that principle applied to many different types of database changes, database changes that you can do. Uh, adding a column is fine, because the old code is not gonna refer to the new column. So additive changes are much safer to do. Uh, but you have to do destructive or backwards incompatible changes, then this won't work. So using this type of expand contracts for database changes help, us, help you deal with that situation. Okay, the other pattern uh, that also illustrates the decoupling of deployment from release and also incremental better than Big Bang, it's called Canary release. Uh, it's, it's kind of similar to the blue-green approach uh, but this comes from this practice, so coal miners used to, uh, when they go down in the mines, you could have like uh, sulfur levels that were dangerous that people could die. Uh, so what they would do is they would come down with this, this uh, canary, actually the bird, and the bird is a lot more sensitive to the sulfur levels in the, in the air, so if the bird dies, they know the levels are increasing so they would run away before they would die. So it's kind of, it's not very, <laughs> nice story <laughs> to borrow the name. But that's kind of the idea of the canary release. You have this thing that you test it out in, in a smaller scale before you roll out to the whole uh, user base. So it's similar to the blue-green approach, but let's say now you have a pool of servers. So I have many, many, this is what actually happens in reality, right? You have many web servers serving traffic or many application servers. Uh, instead of switching everyone to the new phase, uh, when you're doing a canary release, you're gonna release just to a segment of the user. So, and different companies have different approaches for how to select this. Uh, you can do like a random sample of five people, or I can choose 5% of my pool and say whoever ends up in that, uh, in those servers will use this, this version. Uh, Facebook, they have a two layer canary actually. So if you're an employee, you're always looking at the, the new, new version of Facebook. When you're, when you're working at Facebook. So you're kind of the first canary, so if you find a bug, 
it's not out in the wild work uh, yet, so you can tell the other teams to fix it. Uh, and then they have the canary for releasing to the whole population of users, and they can choose, they actually have a very sophisticated way to say, I want to release this feature to this geography or to maybe this demographics, to, I don't know, teenagers between 15 and 20 years old. Uh, because they have that data and they have a very mature deployment process, they can do very fancy things in this uh, in this case. But the idea is that you're going to test it out with some uh, small population and see how things go. If nothing bad happens, then you can increase that frequency. So most users will be using the new version. You can even like decommission some of the old uh, infrastructure, and then at some point everyone's going to be using that new version, and then you can kill the old one. So it's a it's it's kind of like a how to break th things down even further. So blue green has the things in parallel to reduce the risk. Canary is I have the things in parallel and I'm going to release slowly even smaller increments to make the risk even smaller. The next pattern is feature toggles and it also helps us with separating deployment from release. Uh, the idea here is really simple. So if I have two versions of a feature that I need to release. Uh, I might create, let's say there's different approaches, but one way is to do it through configuration. So I'm gonna have a boolean there that says share with friends feature is disabled. So I don't see the button here. If I flip that toggle to true, then it's gonna show up. Uh, and that's a way to have the code out and not be released to real users. Uh, there's actually an article, I didn't put the link here, but one of our colleagues wrote about different ways to implement feature toggles different types of toggles that you can use. Uh, I'm not getting to a lot of details here, but I'm gonna make sure I add the link to the slides before I share. But this is one approach to help with that. So it's like you can keep releasing the code to production without having people actually using it. Uh, you can, this is useful for QAs as well. So the QAs can, let me test how, how this feature is going. They can toggle that feature for their environment or for their uh, instance and test things out before it's released to the wild. This helps with canary release as well. You can do canary for the toggle on. It's very, very useful. And it helps with trunk-based development. So when I was talking about everyone working on the same code base, uh, this, this example is like I'm trying to hide a new feature, but I can use a feature to toggle between the old and the new implementation, for instance, if in that example I gave about I want to replace the database integration in the service. I might have a toggle that says use the database or use the service. And I can keep releasing the two versions of the code and the toggle on and off to test the new version. That's actually what I did in that project that I talked about. Uh, we, we moved the database co integration code to the service uh, and it took actually like three or four months to when make sure everyone was happy with the new service. Uh, during that period when we would switch on the toggle, we found a lot of uh, bugs uh, or features the, the service was so the service was being built by a different team and that's kind of why uh, I added that extra toggle. Uh, so they were trying to rebuild the same functionality and of course it, it wasn't total one to one parity. So we would find a lot of kinks as like, oh we're gonna try to use the service and then the app is not giving you back the same results. So we would flip back do some investigation, fix the service or fix the app try again. So it took actually three to four months before everyone was happy that the service was doing the same thing that the database version was doing. All right, uh, the next pattern uh, is called dark launching. Uh, and this is something that uh, Facebook actually did. Uh, again, it illustrates that idea for separating deployment from release. So when they were building out that chat feature, so I don't know, was old enough, but Facebook didn't used to have that chat feature inside Facebook or Messenger uh, before. Uh, and they were they, they were afraid that that was gonna generate a, lo a lot of load because everyone's gonna use it. They have billions of users. Uh, I'm not sure if my infrastructure is uh, built to support that. So they had this backend that would kind of make sure the messages get routed to the right place. Uh, so what they did uh, is they actually put a fake client on the on the client uh, that would pretend to be the user and just generate some random messages. So if I was logged into Facebook, I wouldn't see the feature there, but there was kind of like a robot in, in, in running behind the scenes, just <coughs> sending random messages to my friends. Uh, and then it would pop around and then if everyone was running that, 
you could actually test the back end and see all these fake messages if you'll be able to support that without users actually knowing that the feature is there. Uh, and then when they were happy that the backend was uh, good to support, then they just flip the feature on, on the client side, and then you can actually send real messages and not the fake ones. Uh, so it's kind of like a cheat way to do, if you're Facebook scale and you want to do loads testing, you could have a bunch of infrastructure to fake uh, millions and millions of users, or you can use real users without them being aware, just generating random messages to, to generate a load for you. Okay, I have two more patterns. Uh, this one is a little bit more on the infrastructure management side. So those ones were kind of how to release code uh, deploy. This one is about uh, how to manage your servers. Uh, this pattern is uh, Phoenix servers. So the usual way people handle configuration in servers is what we like to call Snowflake servers. And Snowflake because each one is unique and special in their own way. Uh, so you have a server running somewhere, you need to make a change, you log in, you make the change, you install the package, you change the config. If you are careful, you, you rename the configuration file .old or .backup, so you, have, you can go back. Uh, and then it's, it's good. Then a few days pass, you need to make another change. You log in again, you make those changes. And then after a while, no one knows how the server got to the current state because many people did that along the way. Uh, it's very hard to track the changes. Uh, we don't like that, so don't do that. Uh, there are some tools these days, actually, especially in the cloud environment. There's no reason to do this kind of manual uh, configuration anymore. Uh, Chaos Monkey, for instance, from Netflix is something that just goes around and kills random servers. It's a way to prevent this from happening, because if you don't know when things can blow up, then you have to have a much better process to get the server into the right states. Uh, Phoenix Server is one way to solve that. So uh, there's tools these days, and my book goes into a lot more details, how to manage infrastructure as code. Uh, so you, you actually make these configuration changes as code, so you declare, like, I need to install this package, I need to configure this file, uh, I need this service to be running. Uh, that in code, and that creates kind of like a delta, and then tools like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, they, they, they can take this declarative statement for what the system should be, uh, and they know how to apply that change to the server. So you use the tool to generate that delta, and then the, the tool will apply the delta, and get your server to the new state. After a while, you need to make some more changes. You don't do it on the server, so you go and you change your code, your infrastructure code, to kind of say everything that needs to happen. It's gonna generate a new delta. And the idea for Phoenix servers is you actually burn that server, or you reset that server, before you apply that change. So you're always going from a known state, and you, you get the server to, to the right uh, state. That gives you traceability, uh, Managing that infrastructure as code, you can actually build and test pipelines for that. Uh, and I have examples in the book as well how to handle that. Uh, it's a lot more uh, safe way to do it, less risky way. Uh, the natural conclusion, so Phoenix servers, uh, you could potentially use the same server, right? Just, just rebuild it. Uh, the next practice is kind of the natural conclusion, and we call that immutable servers. So it's a very similar story. But instead of applying the configuration, giving a delta that they apply to a server, you actually get a new server that has that configuration, and then you kill the old one, and then that other server becomes the new production. And when you get a new change, again, you keep the history, you give you a new server, you kill the old one, and then you use the new one. So the only difference here, immutable is, it, is not gonna change. Once you configure, that's gonna be the states that the server will run production and if you need new new changes you create a new new server with new configuration you kill that one and you start using the new one this solves a problem uh, we call configuration drift because sometimes if you're using the same server uh, some of these tools they actually like to try to get to they call it converge right converge the state of the server uh, but in real life it's actually quite hard to manage that because let's say in your first <coughs> Delta change here, you said I need this package to be installed. And then the second change is like, oh, I don't need that anymore. If you just remove that from, from the code, 
the tool doesn't know that you have you already installed it before. So if I'm applying the second version in a new server, it's not going to install it, so it will never be there. But if I'm applying that in the old server, if the right thing would actually be I need to uninstall that package to get it to the same state. So this this configuration drift is over time more and more of these scenarios can happen. So immutable servers solve that because they're always starting from a known state. It's always a blank slate on every every time you apply your configuration, uh, and it gives you it gives you some guarantees that you're not going to get into this drift. There are a few ways to do this uh, immutable servers. Uh, if you're in cloud environment, uh, Netflix actually does this. Uh, you build an image, so an AMI if you're on Amazon, for instance. Uh, that image has your code deployed and it has all the configuration and that's what's your unit or your artifact and that's what you use when you have to auto scale or release the new version of the code. Uh, these days more and more people are using things like Docker containerization and then the container becomes the artifact. So as part of your pipeline you, know, you, you build a container that has your, your code and the configuration required for it and that's what gets deployed to a higher environment. All right, so a quick summary. Uh, we solved some uh, four principles for reducing the risk of redeployment. Uh, incremental, better than Big Bang. Decoupling release from deployment, that's one of the key ones. Uh, focusing on small batches and building quality in the process. And we saw a bunch of patterns that apply those principles. Uh, that hopefully one of these is new for, for you and you can try to apply uh, in your project tomorrow. So. Are there any questions, comments? Anybody has a question, they get free giveaway swag. <laughs> <laughs> so you might want to ask questions. I got solar chargers and USB triple <coughs> cables. No questions? Yeah. An easy one. How many clients do you think are are like using like Docker. So you know, what, I mean, that's pretty, a pretty new uh, thing. But, you know, what's the adoption? Uh, that that's a good question. For, for our clients, we actually ran a survey not long ago. Uh, Sam Newman is one of our consultants. He wrote the Building Microservices book. And he's very interested in the topic and he did a survey. Uh, it's hard to say a percentage. It's definitely not like widely adopted. Everyone is using it because it's fairly new. Uh, but I would say there's a, a lot of people experimenting. Uh, we have many clients using it internally right now for like their build the dev QA environments. So not going all the way to production. Pre -prod. Yeah, more like up until pre-prod as a trial. Uh, we have a few clients that are going with Docker in production. Uh, there's a lot of the Docker container ecosystem right now. It's 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 very uh, in flux. Uh, a lot of the tools is looking at like how you actually orchestrate the Docker environment itself. So people are kind of converting the idea, yeah, containers are good, you should package your application into containers. Uh, but then how do you manage the container environment itself, right? Like how do you uh, balance the load? How do you find where all the things are running? So there are many things going on in the uh, orchestration, container orchestration, service discovery. Uh, there's many tools around that ecosystem. The, the problem of managing servers, uh, you could say it goes away when you build the container because that's your unit of deployment. But in real life, you still have to manage. How do you get the container environment running and uh, available for everything? So it just kind of shifts down a level. So I see people moving towards that, but it's definitely not widely adopted yet, unfortunately. <laughs> Question? So when there's a project with uh, different branches, so which, uh, which pattern should be followed and which one is a good pattern to follow? When you have multiple branches, like uh, how, how, how long do the branches usually lead for? Like, what's the usual? Uh, throughout, the, like, pro, uh, throughout the project, so everyone, every team is working on some different uh, feature mm -hmm. and they sometimes they keep adding, continue the same feature or they keep adding new features in your branches. Right. Throughout the uh, lifetime of the project. So, one thing you can definitely do is make sure you're running CI on every branch. Uh, so every commit, even within the branch, you're still building and integrating. Because it, it sounds like you have teams working in branches, not branch per person, right? I've seen some places where. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. within that team, you're still going to get some benefit for running CI on that. Uh, I would encourage like to actually try to get the integration across the branches more often as well. 
because that's where the problems are going to come from. If, if those branches live for a long time, if you have long-lived branches, then it's more likely that someone's going to make a change that might break your branch and you, you won't find out until later. So the whole idea of continuous integration is actually to try to reduce that. And that's why we, we like to work in trunk-based development, uh, have everyone working off of the same master. Even like if I'm doing a large refactoring, right? Like if I'm doing that uh, contract spec, expand and contracts, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have code living in separate branches, then the surface area that you have to look for is much bigger. And you're going to have to make your change available in every branch. So it's, it's a little bit harder to manage. But if you're in that environment, I would encourage at least run CI uh, continuous in integration within the branch for, and try to make sure those branches don't live for a very long time, integrate as much as we can. So, uh, so when you talk about uh, generic deployments or uh, no, uh, blue flag deployments, you mentioned about the database, yep. uh, which is where the state is. And uh, for zero downtime deployments, that means for every new traffic which is coming in, it could come from the old path or it could come from the new path. Yeah. And you talk about you know the API versions which are there, uh, <coughs> whether it is on uh, the uh, on uh, the code side or on the database side, the structures they all have to be backward compatible. Mm -hmm. So when you see this in practice in, in actual work. Uh, is that something which is an easy problem to solve, or do you really have to plan well for it? Yeah, it's not easy. Uh, uh, some of it is like uh, education on the, because de developers are usually, you're always thinking about the latest. It's very easy to point to that pattern, like, oh, I'm going to make this change. It works on my machine, so it's good. Uh, but the problem is when you have changes that are bigger and have wider impact, uh, then it's not so easy to think about the backwards incompatible things. Uh, there's some practice you can actually do. So uh, we've, we've done this in a couple projects. Uh, you actually add like a smoke deployment to the to the pipeline. So you apply, so even though it might work in like a developer environment because he went and made the database change, you actually deploy their code to an environment that has the database migration <coughs> history managed separately. So you can verify that the app runs against the database that you would likely see in a higher environment to try to catch these kinds of problems. Uh, the more of these problems you can automate and integrate as part of the early phases of the pipeline, then the more likely you're going to catch this. So it's not that they won't happen, but you want to catch those faster before you don't want to let that failure go all the way to production. Since in some ways you actually have to do more work to make this entire thing happen. Yeah, seamlessly. there's a little bit more. Yeah, uh, <coughs> A lot of these uh, infrastructure uh, projects or investment, it's it's about making the process more robust and yeah, it, it does require some investment. But what you see is over time, because you get that confidence, the cycle time gets faster and the team gets more uh, motivated to release the code more often. So there's a net gain over time, but there's an initial investment where you, you have to build it up. And typically the structure changes are not the like, difficult thing, it's the data changes that are Yeah, the schema change. Yeah, in, in Canary deployment, you have data which is sitting in the old structure, right? As you move in the, the data, turn the data over, you have to constantly keep migrating the data also. That's yeah. a real challenge. Yeah, right. uh, if, if, you, if you haven't read like promotes refactoring databases, yeah. there's a lot of practices about like how you, how you keep that a migration phase. A lot of planning and yeah. a lot of testing. Yeah. 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 All right, so thank you so much for the presentation. <laughs> Quick announcement, um, in case not everybody knows.